Okay, I want to welcome you to the Dairy Forge seminar series. And uh, we have had two seminars yesterday, and we're going to proceed with two more today. So uh, we have some interesting speakers lined up, and I, and I hope you find this beneficial. A couple things I need to point out. Uh, before I start, I'm Wayne Koblenz. I'm the acting center director for the Dairy Forge Research Center. Uh, so I will be the MC uh, for the festivities today. Um, <clears throat> please be patient while I make this announcement, but you see some materials and handouts and giveaways on your chairs. I am obligated as a federal employee to say that <clears throat> nothing you see on the chair or in this area constitutes an endorsement by the United States Department of Agriculture. Please keep that in mind. The other thing is this session is being recorded and will be streamed live. So I'm going to ask you if you have a cell phone, please turn the ringer down or turn it off. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, our speaker this morning, and we're very pleased to have him here, is Michael Miller. Uh, Michael has two degrees from Texas A&M University and is currently a research technician and PhD candidate at the Minor Institute in Chazy, New York. Uh, he's a PhD candidate at the University of Vermont. And he's gonna talk to us today about corn silage hybrids and the cost of digestible fiber and I think he's also going to say a word or two about the Minor Institute, just to give you a little background. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. One other thing, Mike says it's perfectly okay for interactive questions while he's speaking. So if uh, you have a question that you really want to ask while he's talking, don't hesitate to raise your hand. We will have to repeat the question, however, so it can be heard for the recording. Okay? Thank you very much. Mike? So thank you for coming. Can everyone hear me? Louder? We're good? Okay, perfect. So the Minor Institute's a private research institution in upstate New York, 10 minutes from Canadian border, 10 minutes from Vermont border, like as much of the corner of the state as we can get. We focus specifically on dairy cattle nutrition. Louder? You turn them up too. Uh, dairy cattle nutrition. Uh, yeah. Uh, dairy cattle nutrition, welfare, and then also forages and agronomy. Um, so today I'm going to talk today about some of the research that I've done. Um, I'm going to build the story of why it's important, show you some examples of some of these new fiber measures and why they help the cow and why they help us interpret it, uh, and then get into a hybrid evaluation system that I've created that I think helps to really evaluate hybrids based on what the cow is going to see. So Virginia Eisler out of Penn State, she surveyed 40 farms dairy farms, and she categorized them as top producing or high profit herds versus low profit herds. And what she found was the difference was that they had the ability to manage forward quality and inventory. So they got it out of the field when it needed to, based on maturity, and they made backup plans when they couldn't. Say rain delayed them on their grass, well that's now heifer feed. They plan second cut that they have to get in the field. Or they had their neighbor bring over equipment. They made sure they had ability to have that forage system and harvest at optimal maturity. What that came back to is that 9% less in feed cost, which is huge. So when cows do get this high quality fiber, right? This is some work out of Larry Chase and Cornell, higher milk components, they're healthier, they last longer in the herd. And again, as the cow lasts longer in the herd, the more money you're gonna make off a of herd. Um, and he showed that less purchased grain and 30% greater income over feed cost. Now it's important to make sure we understand and use some of these fiber measures of what is high quality fiber, right? It could be a very relative term. So you're all probably familiar with neutral detergent fiber, NDF, that's been around since 1973 by Pete Van Soest. Uh, you know, it's a measure of total fiber related to intake and chewing activity. Well, some of the newer measures, some of these in vitro, especially longer time points, so it's in vitro fermentation, you take cow's rumen fluid, you put in the sample with some buffer, and you go up for 10 days. So we call that undigested neutral detergent fiber at 240 hours, down here. And it's UNDF 240. The reason why this one is particularly important is this is the measure of the indigestible NDF. 
This is the NDF that's going to go in the cow. The bugs can't access it. She can't access it. So they come out the back end. So she gets nothing out of this. All it is is fill. And it's actually been related to intake quite closely. So it's an important measure to have that it actually starts to show us what is affecting intake. It's really nice when you can measure something that's indigestible because that means you can measure what was digestible, right? So you can take NDF minus this UNDF240 and you can calculate potentially digestible NDF, PD NDF. And again, if during the talk some of these don't, you forget what they are, don't be afraid to ask, right? It's part of this. Um, so potentially digestible, potentially digestible NDF is what the cow has the opportunity to access. And that's really important to start thinking about the hybrids this way. So with UNDF240, how many people have heard of it? That's more than usual, I'll tell you that much. Even in the Northeast, five people is like, I'm doing good. So we at the Minor Institute have worked with this a lot. So in going from 2013 to 2014, we're switching from really high quality forage to really poor quality. So Kirk Tanch and Rick Grant had the forethought to say, all right, let's measure pen intakes and milk production. They're gonna just switch it one-to-one -one into the bad forage. So October 2014th is the high quality. February 2015th is the poor quality. And they did it across high cows, low cows, and far dry. I'm gonna focus on the high cows and low cows just to go through. So when looking at, for the October 2014, is our high quality. Our high cows were eating 67 pounds of intake, producing 120 pounds of milk. Now the UNDF 240 is about 8.5% on a TMR basis. Um, this is pretty typical for what we see for our high producing herd. Um, I've seen go down to 5.7 all the way up to 13. So looking at the low cows, they were at 53 pounds of intake and 60 pounds of milk. Very similar UNDF 240. So remember this is the high quality. When we switched into the low quality, February 2015, both groups lost five pounds of intake. Your high cows lost 15 pounds of milk, and the low cows only lost five, right? So there's several things I want to talk about. Increasing that UNDF 240, the indigestible fiber these cows cannot digest, it fills them up. It takes longer to get out of the rumen. It limits their intake. So it's an incredible measure for that, and it's pretty consistent. I see it across a lot of dairies across a lot of the U.S., and it still holds. Um, the other thing is, the high cows are very sensitive to this. Your high producing cows who have a very fast passage rate, who need to consume a lot of feed to get the nutrients, right, they're gonna be more sensitive to it. Your low cows lost five pounds of intake, but they only lost five pounds of milk. It was a three times you know, differential when you looked at your high cows. So remember that too, as we start talking about forages and quality. So very small difference in the lab, right? I mean, we went from 8.5 to 12.4. So not a huge difference. But the cow said, yes, this affects me. I, can't, I cannot eat any more. Now, UNDF 240 will vary based on what pens, uh, just really what's going to affect if they're high producing versus low. Uh, also, monitor your farm. Some farms are very different. Your forage quality, stuff of that sort. Uh, this is from Minor Institute in Northeast New York. You know, a dairy farm in Texas will have different numbers. They'll most likely be on the higher end, where 10 and 12 is more like our eights, right? Just because the growing environment. And you know, we have up here the pounds of UNDF intake, five to seven pounds. Again, that varies. It really depends on what forages. Um, really make sure you know what your farm is today. So when you do have a forage change, you know if the intake's gonna go up or go down. So we put some numbers to this, because right, if you're gonna talk to producers, you need to put numbers up. So I used the milk price from July 2019. So when we had high quality forage, we're at 89 pounds with a 4.03 fat and a 3.12 protein. February 2015, we're at 82 pounds with similar components. Using the 2019 uh, milk component pricing, that poor quality forage cost us $1.52 per day per cow and $555 per year. We we're milking 400, so it was about $222,000 that year, right? That's a lot of money. That's the difference between it being in the red or being in the black, right? So these types of decisions, how you pull harvest, 
All that stuff is very important. <clears throat> so we have another measure that a lot of y'all see all the time too is NDF digestibility 30 hour. There's also 24 and 48, but 30 hours become the popular one. Some work that Oba now did in 1999 showed that one percentage unit increase in NDF digestibility showed 0.4 pounds of intake increase and 0.55 pounds of 4% fat corrected milk. Now, one percentage unit, so for corn silage, going from 59 to 60 showed you know, 0.4 pounds of intake, over half a pound of milk. It's huge, right? They're very sensitive to these measures. Forage quality matters a lot. Young 2010, you know, he followed up and said, well, what if corn silage is greater than 40% in the diet? 0.26 pounds increase in intake, 0.31 pounds increase, and 3.5% fat corrected milk. So again, it's there. And I want you to remember the Oba and Allen relationship because I'll come back to it later. So what factors NDF digestibility? So maturity. As a plant gets older, right, there's Every organism that wants to live wants to pass on its genetics. <clears throat> Corn plants are no different. They say, okay, I want to make a seed so next generation can go. Well, as they get older and get towards that reproductive phase, they need to put lignin down, right? Lignin's the concrete in the building. It's also the stuff that makes it indigestible to the rumen microbes and in the bugs, or the bugs. So as they get older, you increase lignin, you decrease digestibility. Temperature, as it gets hotter, you have increase in lignin, increase in fiber, right? It's just like if a calf who wasn't fed a lot and then you up the you know, amount of feed given, they're gonna compensate. Same thing with a grass or a corn silage. If they have the right environment, they're gonna grow. That's what they're designed to do. So that increases lignin and fiber, again, decreases digestibility. Water stress. So this is not drought, but it's in between drought and you know, having enough water. That increases seed formation because the plant says, oh no, I might die soon. I need to pass on my genetics. They put the energy away from fiber and into the, into the kernel. That increases digestibility. Now on the opposite end, if you have too much water at certain stages, the plant says, in order for me to survive, I need to put down a lot of lignin so I can stand big and tall for all this water. And that decreases digestibility. So it all, there's a lot of uh, factors. And then cool night temperatures with warm days. Uh, that will reduce lignin and fiber and increase digestibility. So Merton said cool and dry years would produce the highest forage quality, though some industry data would suggest uh, moderate heat and uh, dry years would actually do the best, especially for corn silage. So how can we improve this? One way is selecting for hybrids that do have improved digestibility. So BMR corn silage, low lignin alfalfa, these are hybrids that have the potential to do it. Uh, harvest at maturity, that's really key. Corn silage, 32 to 38, really depends on your operation, depends on the time of year, right? We're now playing the battle between it's gonna frost or we get it out of the field before frost. So maybe 32 is your goal because you don't wanna lose it to frost. Alfalfa, 35 to 40, but again, it depends on your cutting schedule and what you wanna get out of it. So since this is about corn silage, let's talk about brown midrib corn silage. So two mutations, BM1 and BM3, they have reduced lignin concentrations and increased fiber digestibility or NDF digestibility. So why aren't we all growing it? Well, there's been some hurdles. Reduced yield, increased seed cost, right? That's some of the things. I'll talk about some of the reduced yield through this hybrid evaluation system and some hybrids that we've done at Miner. Uh, increased seed cost, that's one that Right, the company has to pay for the technology to develop these things, so I don't know how to fix that. I can just talk to you about reduced yield. So Northern New York funded, uh, so it's a, a farmer-driven program that funds projects that these farmers in upstate New York want done. So they came to the Minor Institute, actually Eric Young, who's now with USDA ARS, to say that we wanted to test BM1 versus BM3 versus non-BMR hybrids and they wanted to do it over several years. Um, so I do want to thank Northern New York for funding this project. So we had five hybrids using a randomized complete flock design, signed randomly to plots within a uh, 14 acre tile drain field. We chopped them in strips, weighed them on a truck, and then samples from there. 
all the nutrient uh, measurements are all wet chemistry. There's no NIR. Um, and again, it's just because there's relatively little research comparing these BMR hybrids versus non-BMR. So the hybrids we have, so hybrid one is a Mycogen F2 F379. It's a BM3. Hybrid two is a Mycogen F2 F499, which is also a BM3. Hybrid three is a Pioneer PO238 XR, which is a BM1. Hybrid four is a Pioneer PO533 AM1. It's a non-BMR. And then a Mycogen TMF 2Q419, which is a non-BMR. These are all around 97 day relative maturity. That's all we can grow where we're at. You know, being 10 minutes from the Canadian border really limits your growing degree days. Uh, so one thing I want to note is they were all planted on the same day, but they're all harvested on the same day. So we run a full-time dairy. So research plots get done at the end. So that is one thing that caught us in 2017, right? 2017 is very similar to this year. Really wet spring, didn't get into fields late. We planted June 8th for this hot, these plots. And then we didn't get it out of the field till October 12th. And I think the next week was a huge frost. We were already starting to get frosted, but it affected us later. So we had to pull it out of the field. What that did is hybrid two for the 2017 came out of the field at 27% dry matter. So take that into account when we start looking through the data. And I'm gonna show it by year so y'all can actually see some of the environmental effects I think are really important. So when looking at yield, right, one of the most important measurements that most farmers or producers ask. Uh, so on the y-axis, we have tons per acre on a 35% dry matter basis. So we adjusted them all so we can compare across. On the x-axis, we have hybrids one, two, three, four, and five. The blue bars are 2015, orange bars are 2016, gray bars are 2017. So just look at the variation across the years, right? There's a lot. It just shows you that, you know, environment plays a huge role. So when evaluating hybrids, try to see if they have it over growing seasons. It's very important. And make sure it's in your area. <clears throat> That's another key. If you're looking at corn silage that was grown in Iowa and you're in Vermont, doesn't make a lot of sense. You want it in your area so you can compare. So when looking at this, the only yield difference we saw was that hybrid five had a higher yield than hybrid one. So again, Going back to the BMR story, they said a reduced yield. Well, in our study, maybe you could make that case, but I'm gonna show you later on that, you know, you could choose one measure to evaluate hybrids. I suggest you never do that because yield, right? You can have a high yield of really indigestible stuff and guess what? Your cows are only, only gonna eat so much, they're gonna be limited. Or you can have really high quality stuff with a crazy low yield. Running out of corn salads is just as bad as not, you know, you're, you're behind. So beauty of corn salads and why I do a lot of work with it, right? It provides digestible fiber and digestible starch. Since I am a fiber guy, I'm gonna focus on the starch first. So again, hybrids across the top, one, two, three, four, and five, and then what they were. So when looking at starch, we see that hybrids three and four have a higher starch content than hybrid two. I think part of that was that 27% dry matter of that hybrid two in 2017 really dragged that down. Um, it's just too immature, but right, we had to pull it out of the field. That's research. Looking at seven hour starch digestibility, we saw, and this sort of surprised me, that hybrid five had a higher starch digestibility than the other hybrids. Again, this is fresh chop. We didn't did in silo after 120 days. I could have presented that data. We've been here for three hours and not worth it. I think fresh chop tells the story. So, right, yield, just looking at yield doesn't tell the full story. But just looking at percent of dry matter of a nutrient, right, that doesn't tell a story either. So what I did with this system, and I, I like because I think it really helps, uh, I say clear the windshield so you can see better, right? I'm from Texas, so winters up here are very different for me. So that early morning you're running late and there's ice all over the windshield and you let the heater just, just enough, right? That's what I feel like if you use one measure overdoing them together. You don't see the full picture. And that hurts y'all. It doesn't hurt whoever's selling the seed, right? So this is for y'all to try to help interpret. So I said, well, let's look at nutrient yields. 
So specifically, the first one we're going to look at is starch yield. So the starch content multiplied by the yield. See that hybrid 5 had a higher starch yield than hybrids 1 and 2, right? So now we're starting to see a little different picture. We can start looking at it. Now that we've covered starch, we'll go into the fiber. Remember the important fiber measurements that we talked about earlier was NDF, 30-hour NDF digestibility, UNDF 240, and that potentially digestible NDF. So when looking at NDF, we see that hybrid 5 has a higher NDF content than hybrids 2 and 3, then hybrids 4 and 1 have a higher NDF content than hybrid 3. Now again, NDF doesn't tell the whole story. There's a lot of variation around that. You can have two herds having the same NDF, one is producing 10 more pounds of milk, right? There's other fractions in that NDF that we need to look at. Looking at 30-hour NDF digestibility, you see at B or the hybrids 1 and 2 have a higher NDF digestibility than hybrids 3, 4, and 5. Then hybrids 3 has a higher NDF digestibility than hybrids 4 and 5. And again, remember, BMRs have increased NDF digestibility, and that's what we see. So looking at UNDF 240, again, this is the indigestible fiber. This stuff that's going to just fill the cow up, go out the back end, go into your manure pit, and you're going to chuck it back on the field. So you're always going to have a cost with this, and it's going to be higher than potentially digestible NDF. So when look at that, you see hybrids 1 and 2 have a lower UNDF 240 than hybrids 3, 4, and 5. Then hybrid 3 has a lower UNDF 240 than hybrid 4. So again, those BMRs with reduced lignin means less indigestible fiber. So again, this is important, especially with intake. The more UNDF 240, less intake. Very important. A sort of pessimistic view, I try to think of myself as an optimist, so I always look at PDNDF, right? That potentially digestible NDF, which I think is very important to think about what possible energy you can get from that. So looking at that, we see that hybrid one has a higher PDNDF than hybrids three, four, and five. And then hybrid uh, two has a higher PDNDF than hybrid uh, three and four. And again, hybrid five has a higher PDNDF than hybrid three and four. But again, you're still looking through a foggy windshield. You're not seeing the full picture. It's that tons per acre of these nutrients that really matter, these nutrient yields. And fiber yields are especially important <coughs> Excuse me, because they play a role in what you're taking off the field, what hybrids you should plant, and how your cows are going to do. So going to the first one, we have U, uh, NDF yield. So again, the rest of the graphs are set up this way. We have tons per acre on a 35% dry matter on the y-axis. On the x-axis, hybrids 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5. And then the blue bar, 2015. Orange bar, 2016. Gray bar, 2017. So we see that hybrid 5 has a higher NDF yield than hybrids 1, 2, and 3. Excuse me. Um, again, this is important, but also, is this the whole story? No. This doesn't tell us everything. There can be a lot of NDF, but if a lot of it is indigestible, the cow can access it. So we'll go to the pessimistic view first, UNDF 240 yield. See that hybrids 1 and 2 have a lower UNDF 240 yields than hybrids 3, 4, and 5. And then hybrid 3 has a lower UNDF 240 yield than hybrid 5. So again, thinking about what this actually means, right? You're going to harvest it. You're going to pack it, store it, feed it. You're then going to feed something that is just going to go through the cow. It's going to end up in your manure pit, and you're going to truck it back on the field. Does that have an extra cost to you, the higher amount that comes off? Yeah means that seed cost is now a little different. You have to evaluate it that way. So again, that's a pessimistic view. I'm trying not to be a pessimist. Look at the positive. What's there? What can the cow and the rumen microbes access? So PDNDF yield, the only difference we saw was hybrid 5 had a higher PDNDF yield than hybrid 3. Right? So now let's go back to the reduced yield. You know, you looked at yield, yeah, one of the hybrids might have had a reduced yield. You looked at PDNDF yield, though, maybe you can make the argument, but that's pretty close. You know, I think this is also a measurement that's really important because it actually starts seeing the fiber the way the cow does, right? We're not just looking at these nutrients and, and guesstimating. This has been shown to relate to the cow. 
This is very important. With this, you know, I've given this talk for about a year and a half now. Um, and one thing that I always had questions on was how do you calculate them, right? Producers always are like, this is fantastic, but I'm not going to be able to calculate this. So I created an Excel spreadsheet. And I'll get to that slide and talk through it. But another thing that they always asked for was, what is the economics? What does this mean? So right? for an economic comparison, you need to look at, one, you have to calculate how much the corn silage cost. Right? So I split it either five different ways. Now, it's not perfect, I'll tell you that. But I wanted broad categories so it's easy to use. So seed cost, planting cost, fertilizer cost, chopping cost, and hauling cost. Right? If you use a fungicide, put it in the fertilizer cost. You know, your packing cost, put it in the hauling cost. I'm trying to keep it simple. Yes, there's a lot more that goes to it, but there's other calculators. Corn Picker does a fantastic job getting down to, you know, everything. I wanted this to be simple so you could use it and you can broadly put them into the different categories. Now these, I pulled these numbers for this comparison from Miner's stuff and also Northern New York. So Cornell does a great job of putting out some of these co average costs for Nor New York. So then I said, let's ca calculate the cost of nutrients, right? Either dollars per ton or dollars per pound. So I chose NDF, UNDF 240, PDNDF, starch, and then rumen fermentable starch. So this is just starch content multiplied by that seven hour starch digestibility, right? So I will say as we go through this, <coughs> excuse me, that I don't use starch in my <coughs> adjusted and predicted intake and calculator. Part of that is there's a lot of variation around that seven hour starch number. Until I feel more comfortable with it, then I'll put it in the next version that'll have starch included. So when looking at this, especially for this hybrid or any hybrid, what's gonna drive the price difference? Seed cost, right? We're not, you pay for BMR because it has a certain genetic mutation that allows you to have increased fiber digestibility. This is just based on the seed cost. So take that into account, and I'll show you what I did to try to uh, fix that. So this is dollars per ton on a dry matter basis. Again, hybrids one, two, three, four, and five are across the top. Now you see that yield was higher, or cost more, for the BMRs versus the non-BMRs. Again, this is just driven almost solely by seed cost. But if that's your only decision, ma decision maker is seed cost, well then this is perfect, right? It's gonna tell you all you want. Um, NDF, you do pay more for the NDF than for BMRs versus non-BMRs. Though what was interesting is actually looking at what you're paying for in that NDF, right? You have potentially digestible NDF and you NDF 240. That makes up that NDF. So what is that increased cost going towards? Well, actually, you're spending less on the indigestible fiber for the BMRs and more on the potentially digestible fiber. So what does that mean? That means you're actually putting the money towards what the cow can access instead of putting money towards stuff that just ends up in your manure pit. Right? That's, that's very important to think about. And then starch again. It's just driven by that seed cost. So there are calculators out there that do this really well, too. Um, Right? I, I still think it's looking through a foggy windshield. It's not really the whole story because you don't buy a BMR because it's cheap. You buy a BMR because your high cows can do really well on it. Your cows can eat a lot of it. So what I wanted to do was calculate a cost and income over feed cost for a group of cows using just the seed cost and what I showed you. So I chose a high group, 60 pounds of intake, 100 pounds of fat corrected milk, which is a a moderate to low high group from what I've seen in the Northeast. You know, I s you can choose corn silage inclusion. I put it at 35%, pretty typical for the Northeast. And then feed cost for the other ingredients in the diet is 18 cents per pound. Now, this is just what I chose for this comparison. There's all tunable parameters when you start using the spreadsheet that you can change for the farm. And please change it. Don't just stick with what Minor Institute had on here. Make it applicable to your farm. So then, since BMRs do have that increased fiber digestibility, I said, well, let's try to account for that. 
So coming back to OBA analogy, remember the 1999, one unit increase in NDF digestibility was 0.44 pounds of intake, 0.55 pounds of fat corrected milk. Well, in 2005, he added more studies and presented the data again. And still, for one unit increase in NDF digestibility, 0.26 pounds of intake, 0.47 pounds of milk. So that is what I use to say, all right, based on NDF digestibility, how are these cows going to react to this? And again, I s starch is not included in this version. Hopefully, the next version we will. So I predicted a dry matter intake and fat corrected milk based on this relationship. And then I calculated a new income over feed cost, right? Letting that, that uh, windshield defrost. So when looking at it, right, dollars per head per day, you have your five hybrids. So corn silage cost was higher for the BMRs compared to the non-BMRs, right? A lot of that's just driven by seed costs, right? There's a one-to-one -one switch in a diet. It's understandable. So you look at feed cost, right? You have a higher feed cost because the seed costs more. And your income over feed cost is lower for your BMRs versus your non-BMRs. But again, you don't buy these genetics just for the seed cost. You buy them for the technology of NDF digestibility. So based on that Oban Allen relationship, I predicted an intake and milk production. So you see that the BMR cows are going to eat more and produce more milk than the non-BMRs, right? So with that, I recalculated adjusted feed costs to account for that increase in intake. You have to. Then I looked at an adjusted income over feed cost with those predictions. Now the story I think is you let the windshield clear and now you can really look at it. You see that the BMRs, they actually save you or make you money, nine cents up to 31 cents compared to non-BMRs, right? When you think about fiber, fiber is going to fill them up. It's going to limit intake. So I'm really comfortable with using this relationship right now. There are some cost savings if two very similar hybrids have different starch. But again, for this one, we did not focus on it. So some takeaways. BM3s had a higher NDF digestibility and lower UNDF 240 on percent of dry matter than BM1 and non-BMR hybrids, though yields of PDNDF was similar. That's key, right? It's not just percent of dry matter or just a yield. It's these nutrient yields that really matter. NDF and PDNDF yields, I think they're really valuable. The farmers I've worked with in the Northeast, the companies I've worked with who are using this, I found a lot of really, we're in the age of so much data. How many different corn silage hybrid evaluation things do you see a, a year? A lot. And it's not just like 10 hybrids, hundreds of hybrids, and they try to go through all of it. I'm hoping that this can help you start to manage that and look through it. Looking at the uh, predicted dry matter intake and milk production, they were higher for the BMRs compared to non-BMR. You made nine cents to 31 cents more, depending on which BMR you use compared to non-BMR hybrids. That makes a difference, doesn't it? It's a huge difference. That's something to consider. So I wanted that economic so you can actually start really looking at it and comparing it. There are corn silage calculators out there right now that you can do that first part. Just look at seed cost. Again, I think if you're looking at seed cost only, you're probably not in the dairy industry anymore, right? Tight milk margins, tight everything that we need to really focus. So again, one of the things with giving this talk a lot of people ask for was an Excel spreadsheet they could use. So if you go to our website, minor, whminer.org, and you actually click on the dairy, the word dairy, don't let the drop down. It's, it's confusing. So if you can't find it, send me an email, and I'll get it to you. Uh, and under dairy management tools on the right, you'll see it. <laughs> so this will do all the things I just showed you. And you really only fill in input of yield, you put in the quality, and then you put in the, your farm situation, what your hauling cost is, all that stuff. So you can input that to make it based on your farm. You know, this is a tool. So the amount of data you put in or how good the data is that you put in is how well you're going to be able to utilize it. So take that into account. If you're putting in yields, 
where it was just by eyeball. The guy tells you it's 25 tons, but you calculate how much went into the bunk and it's only like 19, right? So take that into account. Try to make sure all the data is accurate as you can be so you can do it accurately. Just want to bring back, you know, formulating effective diets. I think this is really key. You can buy the best hybrid on the market. You can have the best growing season, but you can mess it up when you harvest it, pack it, and feed it. So I really just want to emphasize, you know, choose high NDFD forages. Very important to maximize intake, maximize production. Harvest at optimal maturity. I know this year's gonna be tough, right? It's just gonna be that way. Kernel processing, try to open up that kernel. Break it into four pieces if you can. If not, just at least open it. Give the cow in the room and microbes the access to it. Bunk management, this is key. Packing density, oxygen barrier, defacer, use all these technologies. You know, an average is 15 to 20% loss from the silo, from field to silo. All right, so if I told you you have 100 acres, don't touch that 15 acres, leave it in the field, you'd kick me off the farm. Though the guy who's on the packing tractor, as soon as you dump a load, he goes and has a cigarette or a coffee and only packs it once out of the, say, 10 times he's supposed to, that's a big difference, especially at feed out. You want to remove that oxygen, you want to put it on the cover as soon as possible, let it sit if you can. I know sometimes you don't have carryover. Um, and then really, really sure using defacers, keep the face clean. The bottom one, I guess, is sort of what I focus on a lot, feed homegrown forages, right? Stuff you grow on the farm is cheaper than what you have to purchase. I say high corn silage rations greater than 50% dry matter. I just finished up a study at Minor where we're feeding 54%. Cows did amazing. We could have upped it and I think they would have been perfectly fine. No room in acidosis, plenty effective fiber, did really well. Again, try to reduce purchase feed costs. At the end of the day, that's a huge input that's gonna cost you. Bringing it together, high quality forages, increased performance and health, Weather and environment affect NDF digestibility, so take that into account. When you look at some of these hybrid evaluation systems, ask for multiple seasons, especially now that we're seeing this crazy weather. Uh, BMR corn silage, increased NDF digestibility. Use NDF, MPD, NDF yields to measure and compare corn silage hybrids. I think that's very important as we move forward to try to look at these hybrids the way the cow would see it, not just the way you know we normally do. So with that, I'll take questions and good to go. Yes. You, I didn't hear all of it. Oh. So all the rain that's happened here and, and, and a deficiency in nitrogen, how does that affect fiber disability? It's going to affect yield for sure, right? Um, and depending on when it had the excess amount of rain, the plant, if it's you know in a vegetative state, and I'm not an agronomist, so take that for a grain of salt. Um, you know, it's going to say, I need to stand up big and tall, so it puts down a lot of lignin, a lot of fiber. So you could see a decrease in fiber digestibility. Though, you know, looking at some of that 2017 data where we had a very similar year, we still saw some really good digestibilities. So I don't think it's the only limiting factor. There's temperature, sunlight, all those different things too. Um, let's hope for good fiber digestibility because... I mean, this is a year we need it for sure. So when you talk about increased fiber yield or NDF yield, basically that's a factor of the overall yield and a reduced growing volume, correct? And if it's at because starch and NDF basically do the same thing. Yeah. So what is the need to put starch into a plant and wouldn't that be really so he's asking, you know, as NDF yield goes up, how starch will should go down, starch yield should go down. 
and he's asking why I don't have it in the calculator. Well, one reason is starch content alone is not the whole story, right? It's room and fermentable starch. I don't have a whole lot of confidence. I can show you some data later that shows you seven hour where these cows should have been performing and they didn't, they just couldn't access it. So until I'm a little more comfortable, I don't wanna put it in where it's being widespread use and it doesn't work. So that's the only reason why I hedged the bets with fiber. It's been established 20 plus years of this relationship. I'm very comfortable with it. Um, so that's, I do wanna include it because I think it's, you're right, it's very important. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so there's, you know, oh, sorry. Uh, he asked, you know, seven hour starch digestibility, a lot of variation, it's the only one we have. Is there something coming down the line? I think there is. There's a lot of different groups that are focusing on this. Delaware has a group that's focused on it. We've tried to get some stuff going, focusing on it. You know, I think ideally it's gonna be, you know, maybe not another time point, maybe using another technology, gas fermentation, something of that, that maybe can pick up those differences. Um, but right now, yeah, seven hour, it's just a lot of variation around it, so I don't have a whole ton of confidence. Uh, but I think, I bet you at the next two, maybe three years, we'll have another measure that should be more accurate. Yes. Yes. So he's asking about that case study at Minor. We went from high quality to poor quality. And he's asking, why didn't we adjust the diet? So we pull out some of that corn silage and add another digestible fiber source. So for that, we just wanted to keep it one-to-one -one so we could actually show the UNDF 240. As soon as that was done, we did the exact same thing. Pulled some corn silage out, put in digestible haylage, some byproducts, milk went right back up. So right, it's at UNDF 240 level. You can get there many different ways. Right? And that's where the nutritionist can help balance that. It's just if you put up a lot of corn silage short on haylage, you're just, you can be stuck. But you're right, byproducts, other digestible forage is very key. Get that number out. No, no, we didn't, we didn't measure it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. We do have some uh, study that came out last year, and Rick Grant has been uh, talking a lot about it, where we looked at different particle sizes and UNDF levels and byproduct diets and high forage diets. So I can send you some of that information if you'd like to see it. Yes. So they were chopped with the same chopper for all three years, same chop length, same kernel processor. So it was all very similar. Yes. Yeah. So they literally went in strips, right? It's a block of four or block of five. And he went and cut the BM3, say the hybrid one. And then he'd go to the next block, cut it. And then he'd go in and it was literally all done within a few hours, same chopper, same chopper we had for the three years. It's a John Deere 7300. It's the old chopper we used. Yes. Yes. So this stuff, we actually only did enough to do mini silos. So we did vacuum bags uh, just to have mini silos for the replication. All I showed was fresh chop today, but I do have the ensiled stuff that I can send if anyone's interested. Yeah, I know it'd be better on bigger bases, uh, but for this project, the funding only allowed mini silos. Thank you for coming.